Night folks, welcome to the weekend. Here in the UK it's a long weekend, Friday and Monday are both public holidays and I have been taking advantage of some extra reading time. Talking of which, let's take a look at what I've been reading this week and quite a bit it turns out. Uh, I read Thorns by Robert Silverberg, uh, which was first published in 1967. I think this is my third Silverberg and my expectations are now high, having really enjoyed the first two. In Thorns, I wasn't disappointed in terms of the writing, it's excellent, but was I engaged in the story? Duncan Chalk is a grotesquely obese multimedia mogul. He has his people find two damaged individuals that can be the focus of a new reality show. Mina Burris is a star man, and he's recently returned to Earth after a traumatic experience, very traumatic, actually, from reading it, as a captive of some aliens who surgically altered him quite drastically to improve his basic human body, both inside and out. His freakish appearance draws attention wherever he goes and he's becoming a hermit as a result. Lona Kelvin is the other damaged goods. She's a naive 17-year-old who is famously the mother of 100 babies and yet still a virgin. She's been the victim or the participant in a revolutionary IVF technique, which would be commonplace now, but in the 1960s was considered to be. She, and she was briefly, as a result, the focus of a lot of media attention. And refused access to her baby, she's now depressed and driven to attempt suicide repeatedly, but doomed to be saved every time. Is there a more unlikely couple? Chalk thinks that they'll be perfect. Each is tempted to participate in the show on the promise of what they most desire, a new body for Burris and babies for Lona. The majority of the story focuses on Burris and Lona's stuttering attempts at a relationship, microscopic cameras following their every move. Um, And as Chalk predicts, they eventually come to hate each other. um, And this is what he really wants. Um, It's what he thrives on, in fact. He's a kind of a leech on the pain and discomfort of others. An emotional vampire, we might say. I like the writing, it's Silverberg after all, and I like the ending. And I thought that the main characters were unlikable in their own way, and I think that that was entirely intentional on Silverberg's part. I do think that this is my least favourite of the three Silverbergs that I've read so far. The other two being A Time of Changes and... What's it called? Time Travel One. Up the line, there we go. I also finished Market Forces, which I've been reading slowly on audiobook or listening to rather, um, and finally finished it in the week. Uh, this was this book was not what I was expecting at all. The premise is teed up in the blurb. We're in a near future world, a dystopia of sorts, where the world of high finance has graduated beyond mere stocks and derivatives, and we're now into conflict investment, where profit is to be had in small wars around the globe. So this much is I was expecting, and there's a fair bit of that in the book, but it quickly becomes clear that this is really just the background, the wallpaper, if you like, for the story. The real focus of the book is on the characters, and the the corporate career ladder in this world has been replaced with road battles. This is what I wasn't expecting. Tenders are won and lost this way, challenges are thrown down and accepted, and partnerships in high-flying firms are lost and gained in this fashion. The city-wide boys are exactly as reptilian and slimy as you imagine, but now they duke it out on the deserted roads in soup up heavily armoured BMWs and Saabs, and to the death, it's all very Mad Max. Chris Faulkner is the protagonist, recently hired by Sean C.I., a big City of London operation, and he's pulled himself up by his bootstraps, seemingly escaping the ravages of the zones, the rundown slums where the majority of the population live. He makes both friends and enemies at Sean, and there are wheels within wheels, no pun intended. I won't try to summarise the whole plot here. It, I really like this book, and I like the sweaty stresses of the road battles, I like the descriptions of the zones, which are the scene of more than one after-work excursion, and more than one explosively violent confrontation. Some of the characters are quite likeable, but all are thoroughly horrid in their casual attitude to violence, both small and large scale. They see it as a necessary price that they have to pay for a high salary and a nice place to live well outside the zones. It's all pretty dystopian. It actually reminded me of a short story in Harlan Nelson's Deathbird Stories, I forget what it was called, where drivers act out their road rage with heavily armed cars. In general, I really recommend Market Forces. I thought it was very good, not least for so utterly confounding my expectations. I was planning to read Make Room, Make Room for Harry Harrison next, but I got distracted uh, instead by Keith Roberts' The Furies, which was first published in 1966. This was very enjoyable. I do like a good catastrophe, and in The Furies, we get two for the price of one. At the beginning of the book, there are sporadic sightings of giant wasps, initially dismissed as being a trick of the light or 
people seeing things, delusions. But there is soon physical evidence. And if three-foot armoured carnivorous wasps weren't bad enough, next there is a nuclear test gone wrong, which triggers a global earthquake which destroys buildings and splits the countryside asunder. This was my first Keith Roberts book, and I very much enjoyed his writing. Um, it strongly reminded me of a slightly grittier John Wyndham. I enjoyed the... I enjoyed the human scale of the drama as well as the sort of big picture catastrophe. The protagonist is Bill Andrews, is sort of an everyman character who's a cartoonist by trade, hardly the hero archetype. And in the early stages of the book, he makes friends with Jane, the very matter of fact teenage daughter of the big house across the fields. Their, their relationship's well done, I think, and despite their obvious age difference, which would certainly draw comments and snide remarks, if not outrage in this day and age, I had high hopes for them and I thought they might become uh, more of a thing. The initial phase of the book covers their attempts to find shelter, dodging the now very numerous and, more worryingly, well-organised giant wasps, the titular Furies. But they become separated and Bill falls in with a small group of folks that become an effective guerrilla force holed up in a cave system in the Mendip Hills. I dislike wasps at the best of times, so the idea of three-foot killer wasps with stingers the size of bayonets hunting in packs was mildly terrifying for me. Uh, but Bill meets Pete, um, that's her nickname, a former prostitute, a tart with a heart, who, like Jane, is rather bracing company, but in a quite a different way. The wasps, the furies of the tale, set about controlling the remaining human population, using them effectively as slave labour. And as with all prison camp environments, there are trustees, quizzlings that do the wasps' bidding in return for power and other small favours. The wasps are intent on nothing short of domination. I whipped through this book in no time at all. It's well written with engaging characters and the story moves along very nicely. Plus, there's giant fucking wasps. I thought that the ending was a little bit of a cop-out in the wasp department. Without giving too much away, there were definitely shades of War of the Worlds. I did like the way that things panned out for the central characters and their hints at order being restored in a much reduced England with population levels now reduced to that of Elizabethan times. It was very good and I'd like to read more Keith Roberts. And finally I read The Explorer by James Smythe. I got through about two thirds of it this week on audiobook and then finished it yesterday in book form when my when my free hours inevitably ran out on Spotify. The audio was a bit lifeless actually or it was on one and a half speed which is what I typically listen on and I actually much preferred sitting down and reading the physical book for the final part. Anyway The Explorer. So this is the first of four books in the Anomaly Quartet. Uh, Cormac Easton is a journalist selected to participate in a space mission on board the spaceship Ishigura, a mostly automated vessel which is going to take him and the rest of the crew far out into space, the furthest that anyone has travelled, and then bring them back again, in theory. The mission is organised not by NASA, which is now defunct, but by DARPA, the Defence Research Agency, and the mission is sponsored by the likes of McDonald's and Pepsi. The whole mission will be heavily documented, blogged and vlogged for a global TV and online audience. Things quickly go wrong as the rest of the crew of sick die off one by one, and it's not really a spoiler because that is indicated on the blurb of the book. Uh, anyway, they all die in unusual circumstances, leaving Cormac ultimately to stew in his own juices, alone and incompetent. Part one of the book covers his slow decline into madness and eventually self-destruction, and then things get weird. The plot takes a recursive turn with Cormac reliving his experience aboard the Ishigura in a sort of Groundhog Day fashion, or kind of. He's forced to hide in the hull lining so he's not seen by his unsuspecting crewmates or by the other version of himself. He's afforded a fly-on-the-wall opportunity to observe events, much of which went unseen by him the first time around. And the reasons for the deaths of the other crew become apparent, and some of which he's more involved in than he or we thought. The recursive time-loopy plot was interesting, if a little bit confusing at times. As he watches, recursive Cormac uncovers the true mission of the ship. A few other things are revealed during the course of the book which go to explain, or partially so, earlier events. This was my first James Smythe book, and I was impressed with his writing. Some aspects of the book I didn't much like. There was a lot of flashbacks to Cormac's wife and their failing relationship, more than I needed, although it was eventually relevant to the plot. I thought that the structure was clever, the recursive nature of it, and it reminded me of Moon, the Duncan Jones movie, and of the TV show Lost, just in terms of the kind of surreal goings-on. If I didn't have the other three books on my shelves, I don't know if I would be massively motivated to go on with the series, having said all of that. I am interested to know more about the anomaly, and I do have the other four, the other three books, so I, I expect I'll push on with it at some point. I also have some other James Smythe books, which I hear good things about, so um, he's definitely not on the naughty step or anything. I enjoyed it, but it didn't blow my socks off.
Right, channel stuff then. Subscribers are up 2,570, which is up 42 on last week. Uh, as always, if you're one of the 42, a very warm welcome to you. I'm John and I focus on reading, collecting and waffling on about science fiction books. Comment of the week was from Sydney Sebastian, who says that he now really wants to read Emma Newman's Planetfall series because I've been banging on about it recently. That's great to hear and I hope that you enjoy it. And actually he wasn't alone. One or two other people said the same thing. Uh, a shout out also to several people who said how much they are enjoying the channel during the week. This is also really great for me to hear and to give my fragile ego a boost. This week on the channel, it has been a bumper week. On Sunday, there was a book haul, including all the books that I picked up on uh, my wife and I's recent trip to Yorkshire, amongst others. And on Tuesday, there was another episode in the Space Opera series, this time focusing on the 1990s. There are some bangers in there, and it's well worth a watch if you haven't already. On its first day, it got quite a lot of views, very respectable for me. And it looked for a while anyway, like it might get some love from the YouTube algorithm, but it was not to be. And then yesterday there was a look ahead to what I plan to read in April with some thrilling footage of me staring at my shelves trying to decide what to read. It's exciting stuff and you should watch it. During the week, uh, I also watched a few things. I'll put cards in for all of these and my videos and I'll put links in the description so you can find them if you want to have a watch yourself. I did watch some of the usual suspects, um, of, I won't mention those here, but also a couple of channels that I've not watched before or that I watch much less often. First was Jake over at Pulp Mortem, a newish channel focused on pulp science fiction. Uh, he's new to me. I watched his review of The Furies as it was also on my reading list for the week. And it's a funny review and it's well put together and I subscribed on the spot. I think it's well worth a watch. I also watched Grammaticus uh, review and analyse Larry Niven's Ringworld. It was thoughtful and contains a nice bit of history as well as some discussion of the influences that this book had on other writers. And finally, I watched Robin over at Bookends and Biscuits review the latest offering by Adrian Tchaikovsky, Alien Clay. She does a nice job of avoiding spoilers, I thought, and I'm looking forward to reading this book myself. Uh, what's next? A book buying. On Sunday, I, I trekked, as mentioned many times, I trekked into London town for the paperback and pulp book fair where I met a few fellow booktubers and also a few folks that watched my channel who came to say hello which was really lovely. I bought a modest number of books maybe 15 which was less than it might have been um, and I've also had a few online orders arrive during the week so it was quite a good week. I will be <laughs> I will be measuring up for new shelves this weekend. Looking ahead to the coming week with the Easter weekend in the way I think there'll be two videos. Um, first will be a book haul which will incorporate my finds at the paperback fair and some footage of the chaotic scenes therein and that will probably come out on Monday and then I'll be taking a look back at my reading during March uh, and I shall mercilessly rank the books that I read and that will probably be out on Thursday. As always you should probably take the timings with a, with a pinch of salt and I might be able to squeeze something else in, potentially a bonus birthday book haul uh, and we shall see. Reading wise, I'll finish Make Room, Make Room, which I started last night, and I may manage one more book off my March TBR pile before the month ends. And I think that will be Simak's Why Call Them Back From Heaven. And then I should be piling into my April reading. I'll start with um, Out of the Dark for Giggles, and then I think I'll tackle Bearhead by the aforementioned and very productive Adrian Tchaikovsky. I'll see how I get on with that lot, and I can always add another if time allows. If you enjoyed this wrap up, then let me point you to some other videos that you might also enjoy. And as always, thank you for watching. Have a great weekend. Happy Easter and all that. And until next time, goodbye for now.